Mughal tent. Today we pay tribute to our founding fathers who created one of the most brilliant documents of the 20th century, the Constitution of India, and ensured adult franchise for all. We're delighted to introduce our next session on creativity and conscience. This has been sponsored by DMI Finance. Andrea, Andrea Di Robiland's recent uh, book, Autumn in Venice, presents a memorable story of Hemingway's love with the city of Venice and the muse he found there. He'll be in conversation with writer and journalist Pragya Tiwari, writer, commentator, and public int intellectual Gurcharan Das, and author and editor Vinu Venu Gopal. We welcome them onto stage. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out to listen to us, and thank you for waiting so patiently. Um, the session is called Creativity and Conscience. It has a super broad ambit, but I suppose there is some sort of an immediate peg in the Me Too movement. As part of the Me Too movement, brave, strong women have been uh, calling men out and asking that they step down from positions of power that they have been exploiting. But Questions regarding the responsibility and morality of artists are age old. In this moment, when change seems imminent, we are not just compelled to question those who continue to exploit the privilege that fame has bestowed upon them, but also to review the legacies of those who have been hailed as geniuses in the past, irrespective of problematic actions, problematic deeds, and problematic ideas that they might have held, as if there is a Chinese wall between the art and the artist. Does such a wall exist? And if yes, should it exist? And if no, then when, why, and to what extent are we obligated to tear it down? These are some of the questions that we hope to address over the next 45 odd minutes and then if we have time, hopefully we will have time, we will open it up to all of you as well so you can be a part of the discussion. I'm going to start with you, uh, sir. You, the title, when I read the title of the uh, session, I was reminded of your books uh, on dharma and karma. Uh, the difficulty, dharma, the, ka the difficulty of being good and karma, the riddle uh, of desire. Uh, very quick question. Um, what do you see art as? What percentage of dharma and what percentage of karma? Well, actually, uh, the, the nation, notion of dharma does throw some light on this issue because it separates the public sphere from the private sphere. And so there's the public sphere is often raj dharma and the private sphere also has uh, nuances in different kinds of dharma. But it's important to differentiate the public and the private, I think. Uh, <clears throat> E.M. Foster actually brought it home very well when he wrote a book called Two Chairs for Democracy. And people asked, but why, two, why not three chairs? Why only two chairs? And Foster said, that I reserve three chairs only for the private life. So the, the, the fact of the matter is that there are two different uh, measures. And frankly, I don't care what kind of a person Shakespeare was, whether, whether, whether he was moral, immoral. I think it's, for me, it's irrelevant what he did. For 500 years, he had 
he has now given us so much pleasure, enhanced, enriched our civilization. And, 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 and so, 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 so I think that's, that the artist has two personas that, that we should be aware of. Uh, and, and we should, I think we should not confuse the, 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 the motives of a person are different, are, are, are irrelevant. Talent and morality are two different ideas. And, and so, um, <clears throat> I'll, give you, I'll, I'll, there was, I'll give you an example that brings it out. Um, a few years ago, I read in the papers, the, a child was drowning on a beach in Goa. And a young man jumped in to save the child. And the reporter from the Times of India went up to this young man and said, you're a hero. Why did you do it? And he said, well, you know, we are a college party on a holiday. And I was trying to impress a girl in our party. And the, the uh, reporter said, but then you're not a hero. But you could argue the child was saved. The moral deed was done. So I think in the public sphere, consequences matter. In the private sphere, motives matter. So you, if you are a good human being, and I think we should just separate the two. And I'm, I'm also reminded about somebody, say, Manmohan Singh, our former prime minister. Now, he really is a very a wonderful human being, very humble. I remember when he was out of power, he, he invited me to his house because I was, I was writing a book and I wanted some information. And that day, he said, well, you know, there's nobody in the house today. So he went and made tea for me in the kitchen. And both of us, and we conducted part of the interview in the kitchen. And I was really struck with him. But then, if you look at it, he was a failure as a prime minister. And that's a very different uh, uh, way to judge a person. In the same way, we are in Jaipur. Jaipur produced Lalit Modi who created the IPL. And wow, what an amazing creation. And we should, and he was a crook. So I think we should separate the, the two sides. And I, I take your point, sir, and I think we will return to this in, in a bit uh, about the difficulty of being able to always separate uh, the private from uh, uh, the, uh, what is put out in the public and uh, this question of consequences. Uh, but uh, uh, moving on to... Uh, just one second, sure. you know, I just finished the point. That I, I was going to give you another example of Churchill. Yeah. Now, Churchill saved uh, the world from Hitler. Of course, he also, uh, he, was, he, was, he was, as far as we Indians are concerned, he was a bad man because he didn't want to give India independence, etc. But as a, in his private sphere, he was an awful man. You read about, I mean, it was so filled with his ego. I wouldn't want to have dinner with such a man. Well, I, would, I would certainly want to have dinner with Churchill. But we'll come back to that. I mean, I, I take your point um, uh, that we, we need to, uh, uh, I, I suppose that's just what I was trying to say in the beginning, uh, in terms of reviewing legacies, we need to uh, add a little bit of nuance to uh, how we look at uh, these, uh, uh, you know, towering figure, figures from the past. I mean, uh, Vina, you have written, you recently wrote an article about Salinger and uh, Joyce Maynard, and you ended it with this wonderful line, and I'm going to quote, um, it is inevitable that a new generation will be introduced to a classic with a heavy foreword on the fallibilities of the creator. The emotional toil of loving a work while scorning its creator will be theirs to bear. Um, and it's a wonderful last line because it also sort of leaves it open. It leaves it to um, the reader to make what they will of um, these two aspects of Salinger's life. He was, a, you know, uh, he was a good writer, he was a great writer, and he did what he did to the women in his life, particularly Joyce. Uh, left to you, what, what would your personal stance be? That he should not be read, he should not be taught, or that both these aspects of his life are highlighted equally um, for generations to come when they are introduced to his work? Um, you know, 
I understand the theory of keeping the private and the public separate, but I don't think it can be practiced in, in any real way. Uh, especially in Salinger's case, as you know, I mean, he's uh, built this legacy of being this wholesome author who left the phony world of New York and pursued this life in rural New Hampshire, and uh, he did not want to sort of... Uh, uh, a large part of his legacy is him shunning uh, the world that made him famous because he thought that that wasn't real and that his moral compass did not allow for that. And then comes the story of Joyce Maynard, um, and it turns out that uh, Salinger had this uh, propensity to befriend uh, young women, often teenagers, uh, have them visit him in his home, and uh, sort of uh, initiate romantic ent entanglements, and then when, when that becomes too much, uh, then he just sort of cuts them out of his life altogether. So I find it particularly problematic with people like Salinger because a large part of their legacy is about how good they were. And, and, and it is a lie at, at the end of the day. So if you are coming into Salinger's work because you've heard about this sort of wholesome man, uh, then you need to know the other, part, uh, the other side of the story as well. And Joyce may... Uh, and so while I, I will not say shun the work, I think that no work of uh, creation, whether it's art or literature, needs to be shunned. Um, you have to approach it knowing all the facts about the creator as well. And if you still love the work, despite the fact that the creator is a shitty man, then the work stands for itself, right? That is, that, then that work is a credible piece of work. I want to bring, uh, I want to say one more thing about Joyce Maynard in this, in this story. It, and that is that she wrote this book um, about her life with Salinger in 1998. And when the book came out, everybody slammed her. Uh, even liberal uh, establishments like the New York Times, Maureen Dodd in the New York Times called her a termite and lumped her with Monica Lewinsky. And, and we can see now how the, how the narrative has changed about both of these women. And so therefore, like you said, this is a point in time, right? And this is a point in time when victims' voices are being heard and, and their stories are being authenticated. And therefore, I think Joyce Maynard's story about Salinger is only pertinent now. I mean, it wasn't pertinent then. So this is a point of inflection. And from here forward, we need to address how we look at the work of art or literature or any creation and how we look at the creator. Uh, and I find Salinger's very problematic. Uh, there are some other stories which I don't find that problematic. So we need to sort of constantly calibrate that as consumers of these creations as to how much we want to accept the art and how much we want to criticize the artist. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I really hope to uh, delve a little bit more into this question of, uh, you know, how do we separate uh, the art from the artist or, or, the, or the creator from the work or the public from the private. But I have to take the point that you made about Joyce, uh, Joyce Maynard's book being uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, slammed in, in public when it came out. Because there are so many, when we uh, look at the list of great creators, so many of them um, have been misogynists, if not sexual offenders. But what is even more overwhelming is that that list of the greats is overwhelmingly male. And um, so perhaps instead of, uh, and uh, not instead, but alongside debating how do we consider the voices of people like Salinger or the works of people like Picasso, we should also be asking um, how we can empower women voices. I mean, why aren't there enough women uh, artists and, and writers, uh, etc., who are hailed in the same way? And I think I'd like to take that to you. You've written a book about Hemingway recently, and I know that's not the focus of your book, but um, I, was I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on his relationship with Martha Gellhorn. Um, I was a teenager when I was conditioned to think that Hemingway was a fabulous writer, and I'm not taking that away from Hemingway at all. There's a lot that I've learned from him as a writer, but it was only in my late 20s that I discovered Martha Gellhorn, and I was absolutely shocked that she's not more celebrated as a war correspondent. Her work still has aged really, really well, and uh, yet she is a, a sort of sideshow in Hemingway's life story, isn't she? What do you make of that? 
Well, um, actually, on this whole issue, the, the, the notion, when I wrote my book on, on Hemingway, um, I wasn't thinking about Me Too, uh, and I wasn't thinking of Dharma, though the concept of Dharma actually is very useful uh, in, in, in looking at Hemingway's behavior in this particular instance, which is uh, the story of his romance with this very young Venetian girl. And I hope I'll get a chance to talk about that. But to go to your question, uh, Martha Gellhorn was um, a, ver a very strong woman, a very strong character, a wonderful uh, journalist, and a wonderful writer of nonfiction. She wrote uh, two or three good books, uh, The Face of the World, uh, uh, The Trouble I've Seen, and, and so on. Um, uh, but she did not write two or three, you know, immortal books, and that, that's really the difference. Martha Gellhorn was a wonderful journalist, a wonderful writer, and there are a million wonderful writers and uh, uh, wonderful journalists around the world. Um, on the other hand, so I think there's a difference between the statue of Martha Gellhorn and... Uh, and Hemingway, and it doesn't have to do with gender. Now, going back to the second part of the question, I do think that we're living through a wonderful moment in which a lot of female artists and female uh, uh, writers uh, are being uh, uh, given uh, much more space and we're becoming more aware of their Im important role in, in our society. And I think that's, that's a very positive development of, uh, of what we've been seeing in the last two, two or three years. I, uh, um, I, I'm not sure I agree with your point that Hemingway's success did not have to do with his gender. I think he's no, very no, constructive. I, but we'll come to, I mean, that's really <laughs> not the, the conversation we're having over here. Um, you've written, coming to your book, the book yeah. that you've written, Autumn in Venice, um, a lot of it is about Hemingway's uh, late years and uh, his relationship with Adriana, who um, was a big uh, influence. Well, influence is, is, is a good word to use, but the word that, that's often used is muse. Uh, and uh, sort of um, was uh, credited um, as um, somebody who inspired his second coming, and he ended up finishing a lot of um, important works. Um, I don't know if they were immortal or not, but uh, but some 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 Im Im uh, you know some of his um, well-known works were finished when he was uh, with her. But she also suffered the consequences of having been in that relationship. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it's... Uh, the, the, I, briefly, the premise is that he comes to Venice. Uh, 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 he is about to turn 50. Uh, he is uh, actually a writer who is considered a finished writer. The, he has his best work behind him. The critics are interested in other young, up-and-coming writers. Uh, so he's going through a personal crisis. He comes to Italy with his fourth wife, um, incidentally, another journalist who decides, unlike Martha Gellhorn, uh, not to play that game and to, and to uh, give up her career for her uh, husband. But in any case, he comes to Venice and he falls in love with this 18-year-old uh, lovely Venetian uh, girl. Um, and, um, you know, you'd want to say to him, uh, you know, leave this girl alone because this, this relationship can only spell trouble. You're a married man. You're a legendary figure. Don't ruin the life of this, uh, of this girl by, uh, by having a relationship uh, with her. Uh, and over and over in writing the book, there are moments in which I would like to step in and say, Hem, stop right here. You know, don't take it to the next... Uh, uh, level. At the same time, you did mention that uh, uh, she was an influence. I, I use the word muse, and I, I know it's a hackneyed expression, but I use it in the sort of uh, original sense of Roman and Greek mythology, the, the goddesses that inspired the artists. And certainly Adriana inspired uh, Hemingway. What do we mean by inspiration? We mean infusing creative energy in an artist. 
And in that sense, she certainly was um, amused to, uh, to Hemingway. It is also, on another level, an abdication of responsibility. It's very easy to say, ah, but I am in the throes of the gods. Uh, it is not up to me uh, to take on responsibility. Uh, and so there is a bit of, of that going on. And, and uh, uh, he, for example, when he describes talking with Adriana <coughs> about what happened when he first saw her, he uses another hackneyed expression. He says, it was as if I had been struck by lightning. Now, to hear Hemingway, who detested uh, cliches, use an expression like that, you say, what, what's going on? But again, he used it in uh, the actual meaning of the expression. It was, again, going back to classical times and the gods hitting him with, the, striking him with, uh, with, with uh, lightning, and again, therefore, kind of abdicating some responsibilities. But this is not to say that he did not become aware of the damage he was doing to this uh, young girl. He also could not do without her, because um, after meeting Adriana, he writes uh, a novel. He hadn't published a novel in 10 years. Uh, he writes across the river and into the trees. Adriana follows him to Cuba, and with her sitting next to him, he writes, in three weeks, The Old Man and the Sea. And then he continues on this wonderful role that leads to, to uh, uh, his, his other books, this sort of late flourishing, this second coming, as you, as you said. Uh, meanwhile, this story becomes a huge scandal, and uh, Adriana has to uh, rush back to Italy uh, her mother locks her up for two years. Uh, she is forbidden to have any contact with Hemingway. And Hemingway realizes that he's, he's caused great damage to this girl. She will have great difficulty in finding a husband. We're talking about Italy in the 50s, so a very conservative environment. And he will do everything he can to help her. Uh, and I mean also concretely to help Adriana and her family. With, with money, with contacts, with help, et cetera, et cetera. He, he, is, is, uh, he is very generous uh, with, the, with the family. At one point, uh, uh, he actually uh, makes a gift of the manuscript of The Old Man and the Sea to the family so that they can pay the mortgage on a house they had uh, uh, bought. This is not to say that this redeems him from his responsibility, just to say that he was aware of it but at the same time, he felt that he could not do without uh, Adriana. He was in the throes of a real uh, dilemma. Now, some people might have uh, behaved differently and, and immediately uh, put some distance between uh, him, themselves and, and Adriana. He chose the middle way. In other words, uh, he, he brought her to, to, to Cuba. They had a relationship that lasted several years. Uh, but at the same time, he realized that he had done her great harm, I think. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I just want to, for one more minute, talk about this construct of the, uh, of the muse. I, uh, uh, I, I take your point about him feeling guilty towards the end of this relationship. Um, and I'm glad that you did say that, that that doesn't quite redeem him. I mean, all of us would like to buy our way out of less than conscious, conscientious acts. but. Uh, Sadly, that's not uh, as uh, simple as it, as, as it may sound. However, returning to the idea of the muse, um, even if Adriana wasn't 18, this sort of construct, I mean, I, I get that it's from the classical times, but in the modern age, this sort of construct seems to, because I was reading a couple of reviews of your book, books as well, and Adriana's contribution seems to be Oh, well, she came into his life, and um, there it was, the second act of this great American life, you know? And in, 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 a, in a strange way, it ends up effacing this woman. It, it, it ends up instrumentalizing these, you know, so-called so muses, right? And I'm going to read a, a couple of lines that um, Picasso's granddaughter, Marina Picasso, wrote in her memoir where uh, she details the way in which Picasso bled the women in his life dry. She says he submitted them to his animal sexuality, tamed them, bewitched them, ingested them, and crushed them onto his canvas after he had spent many nights extracting their essence. Once they were bled dry, he would dispose of them. 
I would like to start with you, Gurjan. What do you make of this construct of the muse and um, the artist? Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I still stay by what I said, that I think it doesn't matter. The life of the artist does not matter. The, it's his work or her work that ultimately matters. And whether, who was the muse, whether he had a muse or not, I mean, it's, it's, it, the, to judge, you don't judge uh, uh, the, the public space, the writing or the painting or whatever, from any other, uh, from any other perspective than the aesthetic perspective of what that person has done. Now, motives, what were the motives? Uh, there's an interesting concept in, in, in the classical, in, in, in classical Indian philosophy uh, between the difference between dharma and karma. Dharma is a duty, we are always reminded about dharma because it's our duty to the other. But we forget that karma is a duty to ourselves. And karma is the animating principle of life. And it is the source of creativity. And, and it's a source of creation, by the way, also in the Rig Veda. Uh, it's, it all began with desire, unlike in the Judeo-Christian tradition where it began with light. God said, yeah. let there be light. Here it's desire. And I think that, um, therefore, I mean, I really feel we should not confuse the two worlds. You can be a terrible human being and be a great artist. And we should judge a great art for itself. Uh, in his private life, you don't, I mean, you, you may not want to have dinner with such a person. You may not want to be friends with such a person. That person, as a human being, has a different form of accountability than an art, as an artist. And, and so, uh, whether it's the muse, now, of course, it's true that over the last few centuries, I think, we have made a fair amount of gains. Uh, certainly, uh, slavery. Nobody accepts the idea of slavery anymore. But as late as the 18th century, Kant and Hume, I mean, my heroes, they justified slavery. Jefferson justified slavery. So. And, and now, of course, the, 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 the women, the whole patriarchy, the way it's being questioned, it's quite wonderful, this, this historical move. But don't expect the artist or the creator to get involved in all that stuff. I'm going to come back to racism and classism in, in, in a minute. And, uh, but uh, so respectfully, the problem with, uh, that I see with what you're saying with keeping these two spheres separate is that these artists and these creators that we are talking about uh, tend to be, what Veena was also saying earlier, their myth goes hand in hand, their mythology uh, uh, goes hand in hand with how their work is perceived, how their work is. Um, in fact, that's one of the, uh, you know, when we look at criticism, uh, art criticism or literary criticism, um, there is uh, uh, the dominant thought is that you must understand the creator in order to understand the creation. And it is not quite so simple to separate the two. Uh, but there is, there is a more uh, practical problem here that a lot of these people tend to be put on a pedestal. And therefore, what they end up saying or who they end up being in their lives, there is an argument to be made that that ends up being, if not as influential, then at least to some degree uh, influential as well. I know I can see that you disagree, but I also take your point that, you know, perhaps everybody in the end is fallible, even someone like Einstein, who was a humanitarian, anti-fascist, a genius. He ended up writing things, uh, uh, you know, he may not have been the best husband, but more problematically, perhaps he ended up writing things in his uh, journal, which are very, very racist about Chinese people and uh, Japanese people. But moving away... Uh, That's a problem with people. If people want to judge uh, an, an artist for his personal life. Well, that's people's problem. No, but for the, the artist, artist doesn't exist he without has his audience. Well, I mean, I think you, it does. The work of art can live in solitude for centuries, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can discover something 
about that work. And also you can discover something about the writer or the artist many centuries later. But ultimately, you know, it's the, this problem that you're posing is a problem of the people. It's not the artist's problem. Okay, let me just, uh, let me, let's try and approach this from a slightly different perspective. How do we define consensus behavior, right? Um, you mentioned Jefferson. Um, I'm also thinking of Rudyard Kipling. I'm thinking of Evelyn Waugh. Um, and let's move away from misogyny, though um, it's hard to because uh, it seems to be intertwined with uh, classism uh, and, and, and fascism and racism as well. Um, uh, due to uh, issues of intersectionality, but let's focus on racism and classism that you brought up. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the justifications that's often given is that these artists were very much the men of their times. Um, is that, and these were the predominant ideas of their times. Now, is that a viable excuse or justification? Or is it, and from the other side, on the flip side, is it fair for us to look at these people who existed decades ago from the prisms of gender politics or class politics or race politics as it exists, discourse as it exists today? I'd like to start with you, Vina, and then maybe go on to Andrea. Yeah, no, uh, um, I, I do think that they were people of their time. Uh, but I also think it is, it is all right to judge them for not having stood up to what is, what is very visibly right and wrong even at their time. And, and there were people who stood up to racism. Um, and so these authors who uh, Gujarandas mentioned who were racist, but they were in the 1800s, and you see them for what they are now, I'm pretty sure that these authors will be seen for the misogynist they are, say, 20 years later or 25 years later. I completely agree with your point that you judge the piece of work on, the, on its merit. But if the myth of the creator is tied into the creation, then it isn't, it, you, you cannot shift that responsibility to the people to say that they have to judge it only for, for what the creation is. Because, because the creator has Use, has used it and has sort of used his persona and his image to becoming who he is. So I completely disagree with you on that point, that, that, that these two are two different things and it is the, re it is the re reader's responsibility or the, or the art enthusiast's responsibility to see the work differently and, and, and not judge it by the behavior of the creator. Um, that's number one. And I also want to pick out uh, on, on what Andrea said and the words that uh, you used for Hemingway, the, 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 the muse, the, this sort of, uh, uh, this godly creation, this uh, bolt of lightning that struck him. These are all seemingly things that happened to Hemingway uh, without, uh, you know, and he is a victim of, of these things. And, and, and what he does is to compensate the family. So, so my point is that uh, even in our words, and, uh, and it's all of us, um, we don't realize how much we let go of, of the more successful person, in this case, the male, uh, because we want to hold on to this, uh, to this notion that uh, I love this book so much, and therefore the person who wrote this must be a good man. Yes, he did these bad things, but the gods made him do it, or a bolt of lightning <laughs> hit him. Uh, I, 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 I'm guilty of that myself. I don't want to sort of sully the, the writers I love with the terrible d details of their personal life. But I think now it is time to take responsibility and to speak up and say that, I mean, the old man in the sea will survive no matter what Hemingway's personal legacy is. And I, and I get that. Uh, I think it was Flaubert who said that the task at hand is to uh, is not to change humanity, but to know it. And, and therefore, you don't expect uh, sort of all artists to be, or all writers to be uh, sort of uh, upholders of ultimate moral values and, and to not have one dark thought in their head. I don't think art comes from a place like that. And, and, and therefore, it, it is important to know that there are dark sides to every person and to acknowledge that and to not let not to minimize, but the important thing is you shouldn't minimize it as something that they are not responsible for themselves. 
Absolutely. I would say, sorry, sorry to cut you, but uh, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think, and I, I have to say, I completely agree with you. T the time has come to call it by its name. I think it's very, very important. What we don't name, what we don't recognize, we'll never be able to remedy. But I just, um, I want to come to you, Andrea, with this question, uh, because we, are, we seem to persist, we seem to be persisting with this idea of um, there being a sort of Chinese wall between what an artist or creator does in his private space and what he puts out into the world. But I would like for a minute to come back to Picasso. Now I'm not, um, Hannah Gadsby made the point that we should um, shun perhaps Picasso's art because it's not possible to sell those paintings without Picasso's signature on them. I'm not quite sure I agree with what she said the reasons why she said that uh, his art should be shunned. I don't think any art should be shunned. I will come back to this later, but there is an issue. When we talk about Picasso's contribution to the art world, to the world of ideas, when we talk about cubism, his relationship with women was not just in the private sphere, because when you look at his paintings, the portrayal of women is also extremely problematic, and I, was at the exhibition, his retrospective at the Tate, and not one damn uh, placard in the Tate actually even mentioned that there are, there are issues that have been raised about not just his relationships, fine, you want to keep that in the private sphere, but there has been criticism of the way in which he portrayed women. So, this idea that how you are in your private life does not spill over into your art, is that quite a tenable idea? That's number one, and I would, maybe you can answer that from Hemingway's perspective, because he wasn't quite Picasso. I mean, there aren't that many problematic portrayals of women that, well, mostly largely women are absent from his books. But he did sort of become this embodiment of a uh, uh, sort of toxic masculinity, the lover of wars and blood sport and hard drinking, uh, which is, you know, and these things are very much part of his books. With that kind of, uh, you know, with that kind of the private infiltrating the art, is it possible to argue that the wall holds? Well, about, about this whole notion about the masculinity of Hemingway and, and uh, uh, his role as a macho and the projected figure of, of, of uh, uh, the cliche image we have of Hemingway, uh, I, I hope my book will help uh, to show Hemingway in, in a, a very different light. I mean, uh, he had uh, uh, other qualities. He's also a man who changed over the course of the years. Uh, you you will find that that he had uh, w uh, he had also feminine qualities to him. He had a very confused sexuality. He had enormous weaknesses. Uh, he had um, uh, he was very tender, very empathetic. So there's a lot of Hemingway that doesn't really fit into that image that we have created around him, and that he partially contributed to. But but uh, other people contributed to uh, uh, as well Ab about the the issue of uh, of art and uh, uh, and private sphere. I'm I'm reminded of uh, of uh, it doesn't have to do with Hemingway, but it has to do with Venice actually, uh, and and uh, it 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 has to do with uh, Joseph Brodsky, who was a, 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 a Jewish refugee who then. Uh, went on to go to America and, ha and have his uh, glorious career as a, uh, as a poet and Nobel Prize. Um, uh, he had always admired Ezra Pound, the poet, uh, but had obviously always felt that his views were very obje objectionable. And uh, so he goes to Venice and uh, <clears throat> he's taken uh, to see uh, Ezra Pound had just died. He's taken to see Olga Rudge, uh, who lived in, in Venice. And Olga Rudge, the wife of Ezra Pound, uh, goes on a panegyric uh, uh, suggesting that Ezra Pound didn't really believe the things he said in his radio addresses uh, during fascism. Uh, 
uh, and that he was not an anti-Semite, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, Brodsky uh, gets very uh, angry and upset with Olgaraj, who was then a little old woman. She was very old but, and frail, but still very uh, daunting in her support of her uh, husband. Um, and he says, he concludes uh, at the end, you know, the thing is that uh, we, we have to read Ezra Pound uh, and his radio addresses uh, at the same time. We can't divorce the two things. Uh, we can't divorce Ezra Pound, the, the poet, from Ezra Pound, uh, uh, the man who expressed these, these very uh, awful views on, uh, uh, on, uh, on, 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 uh, on Jews. Um, and so I thought that that is, uh, that is the proper approach uh, that can combine the private and the uh, and I know you will probably disagree with this, but I was just bringing Joseph Brodsky's view because I, I thought that he had thought about this problem and solved it in, in, in this way. Let us not separate the two. Let us uh, read both things. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to ask you a question, so maybe you can take his point and answer that question at the same time. Um, of course, Iman, where Ezra Pound is concerned, after Hitler died, nobody remembered being a Nazi. Um, and I completely agree with you that, uh, uh, you know, both these things should coexist. And in fact, one, that's one of the arguments to be made why um, we must remember the racists, we must remember uh, the fascists so that we're not doomed to repeat history. But we are in this moment uh, where the Me Too movement has been ongoing for a while. And uh, one of the hallmarks of this movement is not just that women are putting themselves in the firing line by naming um, people who have assaulted them or harassed them, but they're also sort of demanding that they step down from their positions of power. And the argument here is that it is this position of power that they earn through their creation or fame that comes through their creation that then allows them to get away scot-free um, when they are being exploitative. What do you make of this position? What do you make of the movement? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm all in favor of the Me Too movement. I think it's a wonderful thing. At, in fact, I have another angle on it because this is a time when globalization is under threat from all sorts of people around the world. Here's a movement that started just a year ago and has swept like fire and it's gone all over the world. Even Muslim Kazakhstan has a very vibrant Me Too movement. So that's, that, that is fine as a trend of history. Just as I said, it's no longer acceptable to be, to, to, to uh, slavery is no longer acceptable, and patriarchy is, should be also threatened in the same way. But let me ask you, all three of you, since I'm the one who seems to be the uh, outlier here, that would you rather, if you, have a, if you have a couple of hours, would you rather read the work of a genius, a brilliant work, by a person who was not good? Or would you rather read a, a book by a writer who's mediocre, uh, second rate, and but my God, he's politically correct, he's an activist, he, want, he stands for all the right moral duties and all that. I mean, I that's that? the question that I want to pose I think to all of you. The question poses a wrong binary. The question assumes that to be a genius, you have to be a crappy person. There are plenty of genius works of literature and art by, by good people as well. So, so you don't have to be a bad person to be a good it writer. That is, that, that is not a right uh, question to ask. Also, so respectfully, I don't think any of us, I, 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 uh, I'm deigning to speak for everybody here, but I don't think any of us is talking about shunning any of these works at all. I mean, if anything, I'm the moderator, I'm not here to present perhaps my side of the argument, but I am all for all kinds of, I'm an absolutist when it comes to freedom of expression, so there's no way I'm, 
I'm arguing for that. Yeah, and I think we should, what we should try is to sort of bring down the wall that separates the, these two spheres. Uh, I don't see why we can't, uh, uh, I think it can be done, Gucharan. There's no, I, the, 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 I think the, the private sphere is, is, is relevant at the same time one can uh, enjoy the work of art per se, but also the people who have created these works of art are interesting people and we should look into their lives because they are interesting, but without any kind of militancy in, in the sense that we know that looking back to the past through the prism of today is, is uh, of course uh, misleading, and, uh, but this doesn't mean that we cannot take a look and, and uh, 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 we can give our position. We don't have to be militant about it. That, this is what we are creating a problem where there is no problem, really, in my view. Uh, well, and you, there see, is a you seem to be bringing back the wall all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, whereas I think we can be very more uh, equanimous about it and enjoy these works of art and also look with interest at the lives of these people and, d uh, and read them with context, right? Absolutely. Give, give, uh, yeah. give it. Absolutely. And, and, and Absolutely. But so let so me ask you... Just sorry, add yeah, one, yeah, one, yeah. one more thing. I, I completely agree with you that you shouldn't look at uh, what happened a few years ago with the prism no, it of today. depends how you look yeah, at it. it. You yeah. shouldn't. And, and I agree. And you cannot judge events in the past by, by what your moral standards today are. But, uh, you know, the fact that we have let a lot of this go on for so long has resulted in, the fa in, 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 in a reality that we are looking at today from the prism of the past. And so I want to sort of bring out this example of the musician R. Kelly uh, in the US who is, um, uh, if you've been following the story, uh, uh, there was a documentary out 10 days ago and he sort of has this uh, cult-like uh, structure with several underage women who are abducted and sort of uh, kept on. And yet there is a raging question about should you listen to R. Kelly's music or not? And I think you have to sort of judge each each crime by its own, and you cannot say Hemingway should that Hemingway shouldn't be read in the same sphere as R. Kelly shouldn't be listened to, uh, and and people are intelligent enough to do it. Uh, okay, let, let so me just yeah. because yeah. just I'd step in about because you again you mentioned Hemingway, but yeah. you see Hemingway was not was not. Uh, the, 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 no, the person, yeah, so nor was he standards. Picasso, by the way, absolutely. in the sense I, that I, I he did, did say not, that. I did. He that loved was a women. He yeah, loved yeah, women. Yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah. uh, okay. So I just, I, uh, uh, but but I I will say this. Obviously, coming out with a book on Hemingway uh, in, in the middle of the Me Too movement <laughs> has been a difficult <laughs> has been a difficult thing. You see, I never thought. While I was writing away, I don't envy the that as I soon as the book would right. come out, wham, I'd be smashed because of me too. I, anyway, well, you know, well, even before point. the book came out, I was receiving emails from readers who had seen advanced copies, and they would write letters to me saying, I can't wait until this book comes out so I can hate Hemingway even more. <laughs> My goodness. And so I thought that no was pressure. taking it a bit too long or too far. Yeah. No, just to clarify, my point was that you have to judge them differently and not, not in the same way. Also, we keep bringing Hemingway up, not because we are holding him up as the example of all evil, but, but simply because that is your latest book and we'd like to talk about it as well. And hopefully a lot of you will go and, uh, and buy it and he's going to sign it later. But I was coming to you because you asked all of us a question earlier when we were talking about the Me Too movement. I am having a little bit of difficulty in reconciling your support for the Me Too movement with um, your saying that we cannot judge what creators, we should not judge what creators, what geniuses do in their private sphere. And the reason being that part uh, of the Me Too movement is women demanding that uh, creators, artists, writers, whoever they might be, um, who have, uh, for example, you know, uh, had behaved less than appropriately or been sexual offenders, they no longer carry on in their position of writers or they, they should not be invited to platforms such as this to be able to talk about, well, they're not exactly talking about 
sexual offenses. They may be talking about philosophy. They might be talking about art, that they stepped down as directors of festivals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I mean, there was that case in Kochi as well. So that if you if you are really supportive of the movement, how do you reconcile these two positions? Well, you know, one of the great contributions of the deconstructionist movement was precisely to answer this question. That earlier literary theory thought it important to know about the context, the writer, etc. And earlier, we did do what you said. But when deconstructionism came, its contribution was to separate the artist from his work. And I would just say to you that um, what, if Shakespeare, what if we discovered now some papers are found and it says, my God, Shakespeare really exploited women. Are you going to tell people to stop reading Shakespeare after that? Is that what you'll do? I mean, that's clear. I, I feel like we've really answered that question a number of times over, that yeah. absolutely no. Uh, I also see, know keep, most of Shakespeare by keep. heart, so that would be very difficult. <laughs> And, and also, I mean, why should we tell people anything? People can decide for themselves. And if, the, if, what, if what is revealed about Shakespeare is, is significant enough for, for you to sort of not derive any enjoyment from his work, why can't they stop reading? We would just like that whatever those papers are, they are out in the public just as much as his works are, and that his works are contextualized by uh, how he was treating women, as much as they are contextualized by a lot of other, the other legends of Shakespeare that seem to make his work more interesting for us. What? Was that a question to yes, me? I, I suppose there was a comment <laughs> that you were supposed to make. You, you know, you can't talk about other people, I mean, outside of Hemingway as well. You're not, yeah. you're not sort of in that box in this moment. No, so what did you want to know? <laughs> I think he asked the question, so about Shakespeare. We discover a box Would of papers. Would you shun Shakespeare? But no, but, they, but again, that you all are building walls again. You, every time we try to put them down, you're pulling them up again. What? The, the, That's the, the it's issue. An, it's a non-issue. It's a, it's it's really. I mean, of course, if if Shakespeare has done criminal actions, we wouldn't be inviting him on the panel, <laughs> but we would still enjoy his plays. I mean, it's going back to. The concept, the Brodsky concept. I mean, we enjoy the, the, the works of Shakespeare. If uh, he had committed uh, criminal acts, we wouldn't be, we would uh, shun him as, uh, you know. As, uh, a, as a person. As a person. As a so, second persona, yeah. not as the artist, not, not as the as, creator. Not as that's the creator. That's a very different, not that's the distinction the I'm not trying as to as make. But that's as why a human I have being. an intermediate position. Uh, I, I think all of us You're group, not entirely but, but, an outlier. I'm, but, uh, you know. Yes, but also there is, there is another complication here where people, if Shakespeare, let's assume for a minute that Shakespeare were alive and he was, uh, criminal acts were discovered and this often happens that people who are in uh, the position of, because rule of law isn't perfect in most countries, definitely not in India, people who are powerful tend to get away with even criminal acts. So that is another complication, and there are many, many complications that we cannot address because we are out of time. Uh, one uh, final question from me, which uh, is another aspect of looking at the moral responsibility of the artist, is we, uh, another thing that's been happening of late is writers' protests in India, uh, in the US as well. Um, uh, today, I believe Geeta Mehta has turned down uh, the Padma Shri, there have been, uh, which was fantastic because she, you know, I mean, her position was that this is election year and uh, the motives might be misconstrued as to why she's being presented. She is the sister of a prominent politician from Orissa. And uh, um, a couple of years ago, there were uh, writers who returned their awards in protest of uh, policies being pursued by the government. I would like to ask you, Gusharan, what do you think is the dharma of the artist in this context. Is an artist obliged to take a moral political position if there is ongoing um, wrongdoing by, yes. you know, in the, in the po political sphere or the social sphere? And, and I would like the I, two of you to come in before I we think, close. I, 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 I think that's a very, very good way to, 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 to put it. I mean, this is the issue. 
I think we would, I, I would judge the artist, the human being in the artist, and I would expect the human being who would be my friend, I would, who I'm con whose motives I'm concerned with. But again, I would say that his work, his art, should stand completely on its own. We should, his position as an artist is completely insulated from the events of the day. Yes, as a human being, he should sign up. He can return all the Padma Bhushans and the Padma Shris. That is fine. That's, but that to me is irrelevant to the work that he has done. Ultimately, the work stands for itself. Andrea, any thoughts on this? No, I, I, I agree. I think, I think uh, uh, it's important to participate. It's important to, in this sense, be militant in today's world. I was saying, let's not be militant in the way we look at the past. But when we look at the present, then I think especially uh, an artist of fame has perhaps the duty and the responsibility to, to be militant as a person. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Vina, final thoughts? Yeah, I agree. And, and I think if, uh, uh, if writers and artists don't stand up for what they feel is right, then who will? Uh, they, they inspire people. And yeah. so therefore, the start of the mo movement has to come from them. And, and uh, if you're going to look at your commercial sort of uh, uh, situation before taking a stance on something that you feel rightly about, uh, then, then you're not a true artist or a writer, in my view. I'm really glad we could end this panel on uh, a note of agreement. We have very little time, but we can definitely take a couple of questions. Uh, the lady there, please. From an audience point of view, really, uh, how much ever I love to appreciate art, I cannot, if I re know about the moral standards of an artist, present day artist, I think it is my right, or rather my responsibility, in the equal breadth to criticize about the artist while I continue to love the art. I'm an ardent, uh, tempted to love the art, as well as not like the artist so much. Is that OK? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, 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 my point is, you can say in the same breath that Picasso was a great artist, and I love his work, but he was an awful human being. And I hate him for that. You're, you, that's a perfectly good position. Um, uh, up here in, in the, the front. last question now? We can take one more question. Sure. Now, yeah, one more question. Uh, but just keep uh, the questions short, please. I'm an artist. Um, I was a little disappointed that the conversation took off without recognizing that conscience is a part of the artist's inner world. And the whole conversation around ethics sort of left that issue aside. The conflict between creativity and conscience is, I would argue, a very important personal issue for an artist. It's really a comment. I don't know if you want to comment on what I'm saying. I, I'd just like to say one thing. We did sort of address it. Uh, you're absolutely right. And I, we did sort of address it uh, because when we spoke about the fact that um, conscience infiltrates art uh, in, 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 in that sense, um, I did also have another question that we couldn't get to, which is um, that what role does conscience play in what, you, uh, in, in what your creation is? Um, but uh, you're absolutely right. There are so many things to discuss that 40 minutes is not quite enough. Anyone else? Want, want I think to? there's some more I, I just yeah. want to say what you said is, is, is very deep and important and is, is very much, uh, sh you know, it's, it's the heart of what we're talking about. And, uh, uh, and you're right. We, we, we didn't put it at the center of things. But, but what you say is, is very deep and very important and very true, I think. Uh, Sorry, there's quick just question, one. last so, question, if you can. There's a gentleman there. Are you going to just keep it short? This is to Gujarin, sir. 
Uh, so if you are working with someone in the current uh, scenario, you're working with someone who's really good at his work, but in person, he's an asshole. Okay, he's really, he's an egoistic, he's a, he's a womanizer, but you're working with him on a daily basis. How do you deal with it? Stay calm and learn or quit, move on? Yeah, yeah. and I think that's, again, we are, we are back to the same issue, that you are, it, you, you have to see two, the two sides. The person as a human being that you have to deal with day to day, I would, I would run away from that person. I would have nothing to do with the person. But if that person has created a great work of art, I'll say I admire, I love that work of art. And I would just judge that work. I would not judge the person. And that's a different, two different questions. Talent and morals are different. Uh, sorry, I don't think we have time for more questions. I really do apologize. I hope you understand that there was a long uh, list of questions to address. Hopefully the authors are around and if you'd like to ask them something after the session is over, I'm sure they'll oblige. Thanks very much for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you, Pragya. Uh, Andrea, Gurcharan and Veena, thank you very much. Uh, the authors will be signing books in the... Uh, in the signing area. Uh.